Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Unleashed with Carrie. Today, I have a guest with me, Robert Farrington. He hey. is <laughs> hi. He is the college investor. Uh, we met vaguely through a, a podcasting group. I invited him on the show. He said yes, and this is our first time talking, so it'll be interesting it. to, to dig into these conversations. I'm excited um, to be here. Thank you. Robert is America's millennial money expert. He's America's student, don't, uh, student loan debt expert. He's the founder of The College Investor, which is the number one resource for helping millennials get out of student loan debt and start building real wealth for their future. And he's been doing this since 2009. Um, Crazy. I think, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think this is a really relevant conversation for the people who are listening. A lot of my uh, students I work with are teens or young adults just setting off on the college journey or in the community college space. So um, if you want, introduce yourself again and uh, let's talk about what a student loan is. Yeah, I mean, you covered it. I mean, we've been helping people for over a decade now navigate this because, you know, paying for college, I always joke is this, uh, you know, it's, it's, it involves everything that nobody wants to talk about around the dinner table. You have money, you have debt, you have family like expectations and relationships. You might even have the government and taxes and programs. It's like like every taboo subject that we say, like don't talk about it at Thanksgiving dinner is what paying for college involves. And so it's such a challenging situation. And you know, student loans are that thing that kind of dominates the conversation today, right? We hear it in the news. Um, they're kind of scary. People think that they're burdened for life on these things. And and then some of it's true, but people have to realize what a student loan is, right? So a student loan is debt that you take out to pay for school. And the collateral of a student loan is your future earnings. So I think that's the part that a lot of people don't realize because student loans are really easy to get. You fill out the FAFSA, you get an email notification from your school's financial aid office, you click the I accept button and boom, you have a student loan. It's very painless, which is kind of scary too. <laughs> but you know, when it comes to that, the collateral of that, so like, let's talk about kind of compared to a car loan, right? Car loan, pretty straightforward. You want to buy a car, you get a car loan, you make your monthly payments. But if you don't make your monthly payments, the bank takes your car away. They repossess it, right? And it kind of resolves itself. The problem is with student loans is the collateral is your future earnings. So as long as you have the ability to earn money in your whole life, so we're talking for until retirement, even after retirement, the government can repossess effectively, right? It's not repossessing, it's you know garnishing your wages or taking your tax return, but they can take your income to pay off these loans. And so it's scary in terms of, you know, these options, if you can't afford your student loans and you borrow too much and you can't pay it, you're going to struggle financially for decades. They can take your social security. They can take disability payments if you're disabled. I mean, the, the, the amount that they can collect is crazy. And, and so I think that's when you get these scary stories on the news. Right. Because we also have this world of the media today where it's like, you know, the average isn't good enough to share on the nightly news. You either have to take these extreme stories. Right. Like you go to one extreme or the other. You either have the person that paid off, you know, one hundred thousand dollars in student loans and they made twenty thousand dollars a year. Or you have the person that's struggling with a million dollars in student loan debt. We don't talk about like the, the normal middle people, but that's just kind of how the media is today. Yeah. Nothing's ever neutral anymore. <laughs> Right, exactly. So, you know, but that's the thing. That's what a student loan is. It is, it's a loan to pay for college. And the collateral on that loan is your ability to earn money. You're, you're effectively borrowing against your future. You're borrowing to earn more money. And that's the goal, right? You're going to college to potentially get a job that pays you more in the future. Otherwise, you wouldn't go to college. Right? I mean, there's, a, there's an argument that education is a good thing. And I don't dismiss that. I think education is free though. You could go to cornell.edu right now and watch some of the best professors in the world teach you something for free, right? They put all their classes online for free. So you're not actually going to college just for this education because you can get educated anywhere. You're going to college because you want networking and job skills and you want that degree to hopefully boost your earnings and, and statistically it does. But you have to realize that this loan is a collateral. You're borrowing against that future earnings to pay for that today. Yeah. So 
you're right in that we we live in you know YouTube University. <laughs> Not that we have to learn from YouTube specifically, but there is totally. so much information available to us. So, how do you go from that knowing that most of us are going to have these loans over our heads? Like. What's your recommendation there? At what point do you decide to go to school, to not go to school? How do you look at that big picture and decide what's good for you? Yeah, well, first off, let's talk about the positive. So most of us do have loans, but that number is only about 66% of people. So a good third of people actually graduate college debt-free. And I think that's- That was me. Stuff. Boom, right, I love it. So no, uh, no, I, was, I was wasn't one parents. of those lucky ones. Okay, that uh, works though. It means your parents probably saved and maybe there's did. some listeners out here today that are gonna think about their future and maybe they'll save for their children, who knows, yeah. right? But uh, a third of people still graduate college debt-free. And so it's a very doable thing. But I think we have to go into this college conversation about it's a return on investment. So just like you would buy a house or you would buy an investment uh, like in the stock market, you're investing because you're expecting a future gain, right? You're expecting your money to grow. Well, your education is the same way. You know, you're going to college because you want to get a $50,000 a year job, not a $30,000 a year job, right? And so when you're spending this education money, these student loans, or however you're paying, even if you're paying out of pocket, it's still an investment. Your goal is to get a career that pays you well down the road. And if it's a bad investment, if you overpay, right, then you end up in financial straits in the future. So let's just say that your goal in life is to be a teacher. That's a solid goal. There's nothing wrong with that. We need teachers to educate the future of America. But you know, the average starting teacher salary, it depends where you teach and what state you're in, but it could be from like 35 to $50,000 a year. And you can Google that. I mean, the, all the stats are out that there. That was me. And, Bingo. Okay. I Perfect. Think, I think I started in the public school at, oh gosh, 36 maybe. Bingo. And then there I went go. to private school and I got paid far less. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's the thing though, but the stats are out there, right? I mean, a quick Google search, you can find out what teachers in your state start at. It's very like just transparent in most yeah. places. So, and this is for any job too. Like, let's just say you want to be an engineer or you want to go work at whatever. All the, you go to Glassdoor, salary.com. There's so many sites. You can figure it out. But depending on what you want to do, if you say you want to be a teacher, you're making $35,000, $40,000 a year. But if you borrow $200,000 to pay for school, ouch, you're going to struggle financially to pay off that debt. It's just the math doesn't work out. Now, there's great paths to being a teacher. You start, you know, go to community college for two years, knock out your undergrad, transfer to a state school. You could be out for like $15,000 in debt. And now, if you're going to be a teacher making thirty five, dollars the math works. It's great. And there's forgiveness programs and different things that can help offset the cost down the road. But the big thing is, is figuring out what you want to do. And then working back from there, knowing what you're going to earn. And that's hard. Don't get me wrong. Like, that's a whole other discussion. of what, I mean, you're 17 years old trying to figure out what you want to do. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was just going to put you on the spot there because no. <laughs> that's something I talk a lot about on the show is we got to stop asking kids what, what they, they want to be do. when they grow up, right? Because they so don't it, even know half of what's out there, not a quarter of what's out there. Absolutely. And that, that's the other thing. We don't expose kids to a lot these days. Like, I mean, when I started, when I was in high school, I'll date myself a little bit, but we still had auto shop. We had wood shop. We had these other things, trade skills. A lot of those have been replaced with computer skills and different things, which is fine. It's, a, it's the day and age we live in. But unless you're exposed to these things as a young adult, you don't know they're out there. Like there's so many jobs that are out there that you just don't even know exist. And they could actually pay really, really well. But unless you know it, you just can't know. But I think the other part of this is, you know, you could go to college, um, maybe, maybe you don't have to, we can talk about that. But like on the flip side, you could keep the cost low. And that also gives you more opportunity. Because if you don't pigeonhole yourself into like one thing, you also have the option to do other things. So if you're not $150,000 in debt, if you're only $15,000 in debt, you know, you can take any job in the world effectively because you can afford the debt that you took on to go to college. Uh, it's when you start getting yourself trapped, not only is like your student loans a burden, but like you're also struggling with all the emotional aspects of your life and career choices and things that you just you don't feel like you want to do. And that just creates a really bad cycle. My, my husband's dealing with that. We still are sitting on his undergrad loans and mm -hmm. he, he's like, I don't even use it. 
Like I did, I used my education and I got a master's in teaching and I paid for that out of pocket and I used it. I was a teacher for 10 sure. years. I taught, I needed that degree. Um, you and know, so like, yeah, I mean, for like my story, uh, I mean, I went and I start, I thought I wanted to be a computer scientist. Right. So I went in engineering and then, you know, when you're a freshman, you're in the basement and you're programming and I just hated it. I just couldn't stand it. So I ended up switching a whole 180 and became a poli sci major and graduated in poli sci. Um, and then I went back and got my MBA. Um, but you have to realize I worked at Target. I was a store manager for Target. So I didn't necessarily use any of these degrees. But you know what the degree did enable me to do, I will say, is that it enabled me to play office politics. So one of these, their targets, one of the companies that like you can't get into management and I can't say can't, they make the process a lot more drawn out and challenging unless you have a degree, but suddenly just having that bachelor's degree gives you a ticket in the door and it speeds up the process. It's kind of like, you know, you just punch your card and you move forward. And so it did let me play the office politics, but I graduated with $43,000 in student loan debt by the time I was said and done. And honestly, I didn't really use any of it other than, like I said, the ticket in the door. And, and how old were you when you walked away with that number of? I was, I finished my undergrad at 22, finished my MBA at 24 and okay. at 24, I had 42 and a half, $43,000 in student loans. So, yeah. All right. So how'd you get out and how do you help others now? Yeah. So one is know what you're getting into, but two, I side hustled my way out. So I worked full time through school at Target. And I was earning money on the side, even while going to school full time and working full time. I was selling stuff on eBay and I was doing that to the tune of about $2,000 a month. I sold all of my own stuff first. I didn't get rid of, I, you know, I had like an old super Nintendo with all the video games and stuff. And it's like, I don't play this anymore. I sell it. And then I was like, you know, moved through. And then I went to my dad's attic and like found <laughs> all this old stuff. I had, a, he had an old record player and all this stuff and I split it with them. And then once I ran out of all of my family's stuff to sell, I went to garage sales and estate sales and I'd buy stuff on the weekends and I'd resell it during the week. And the cool thing was, I mean, you could do that in the middle of the night. Like no one knows when you're answering questions on eBay. And then I just drop packages off on my way to school or on my way to work and, you know, just rinse and repeat. And that enabled me to eliminate that debt in about three and three and a half years. So through working full time and side hustling. That's incredible. Do yeah. you think the whole eBay selling thing would go over as well today? I know plenty of people who do it, but then yeah. I also know like a lot of eye rolls we get, oh, you know, that only works for the, the special people. You know, you, you have to get oh. really lucky to make it work. Well, that's the thing. So people are going to judge you no matter what you do in life. Of course. Right? So when you're doing this, people are like, oh, that's so silly. You're so dumb. Why are you selling stuff on eBay? But then when you're debt free and enjoying life, like, wow, like, look at how, like, how do they do that? Like, how do you get all these loans? I don't understand. He's the anomaly then too. Like you have to be okay that people are going to judge you anything you do in life, whether you're struggling, not struggling, side hustling, not side, driving for Uber, who knows, right? But like, I'm a big believer that earning more money is limitless. You can cut your budget all you want. Like you can never eat out. You can not have cable. You could, you know, have the cheapest cell phone plan ever. But at the end of the day, there's only so much you can cut. You have to live somewhere. You have to get to work somehow. Like you've got to clothe yourself. You got to feed yourself. Like these are like non-negotiables. You can't go down below zero. But your ability to earn money is as much time and limitless potential. You know, we have all this time in a day. What are you doing with it? And I mean, are you just using that time to spend and sit down and do nothing? Which that's fine too. But like, you don't also get the argument that you can complain about, you know, your expenses and your lifestyle and your budget if you're not putting in that work to try to change it in your off hours. Sure. Do you have other recommended side hustles for young people that they can do while they're working or while they're in school? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the list is limitless. And this is the really hard part. Is. Is. Yeah. Everybody has their own thing and their own things that they're passionate about. I mean, you know, a lot of people like kind of, you know, poo poo on the ride sharing stuff, right? Like, oh, driving for Uber, driving for Lyft, Postmates, DoorDash, you know, you see all these things like you're only earning $5 an hour after all your expenses and, you know, whatever it happens to be. Um, but here's the thing is when in the history of the world could you not have a boss? 100% on your own terms, turn on an app and suddenly start earning money 
you could wake up at 2 a.m. and turn on an Uber and go drive somebody somewhere and make 10 bucks. Like that wasn't possible five years ago. So like the ability to earn, you, you got to find something that suits you. For me, I like the deals. I like selling stuff on eBay. I started a blog that started making me money. Uh, my sister-in-law is big on Etsy. She's a crafter. So Every night she's watching Netflix and Hulu, but she makes uh, like these like really nice stationary cards for like wedding invitations and stuff and like puts all this paper together and sells these things on Etsy. And she's making a hundred dollars or so a month just on the side while doing what she actually, you know, she's just sitting at home watching Netflix and making money at the same time. It's like win-win. And so it really kind of depends on what your style, what your personality is. You could, if you're still in school, you could tutor somebody. When I was in high school, I was doing odd jobs for the neighbors. I was doing handyman kind of work. I was doing like grunt labor work, yard work. You know, there's always, like I said, there's tutoring. Like the list goes on of different things that you can do and earn money. Yeah, and now in the tech space, you can like learn how to put a website together or learn how to do Facebook ads or whatever and then sell that and you're never leaving your house. You just learn one skill and you do it. And, oh, you know, totally. maybe it's not going to be your grand fortune, but as a side hustle to get the money that you need to do, you know, pay off your debt or do whatever it is that you need to do, you've got it. And that's it. And I think the other thing, especially like you said, a lot of your reader or your listeners are, you know, young adults, high schoolers, community college people. The biggest untapped source of money is scholarships. I run a scholarship for my site. I try to give away money you wouldn't believe how hard it is to give away a scholarship these days. And here's the scary thing. And I've talked to probably a good, you know, 20, 30 people that run scholarships as well, independent ones. And it's a challenge. So I give away $2,500 a year to entrepreneurial um, high school and college students. It's a good scholarship, right? And all I ask is that you write me an essay of 500 words or more about how you're entrepreneurial, whether it's a side job or just all the things we were just talking about. Okay. I get about a hundred applications every year and that's been consistent over the last few years. Do you know how many people actually meet the criteria to like actually be in competition for the scholarship? Five. Yeah, you, you're not that low, but like about 15 to 20. Okay. So you're really in the running against like 15 to 20 people. And that's how almost every scholarship that's out there is. If you just knock off the basics, follow the directions, you wouldn't believe your odds of actually getting a scholarship. But it's work. Don't get me wrong. You know, you're spending the time to research, find the essays and stuff, write them, submit them, follow up. But if you apply to like 50 scholarships, I guarantee you, you'd pay for at least a year or two of your college but what you actually win. Because it's just an expected value math game. You know, the more you apply to, the more chances you have to win if you follow the directions and all this stuff. But, you know, applying to 50 scholarships, that's, that's a lot of work. But, you know, if you're not working, you know, at like a job or you're not side hustling, it's also a great way to pay for school that is, that makes up for it, right? Yeah, I remember doing the whole college thing and scholarship thing and, you know, there were the scholarship search engines and, it would take forever to pour through them and figure out which ones, you know, I was even potentially qualified for. And yeah, it's definitely work. Like, don't get me wrong. And those scholarship search engines are tough too, because there's a lot there. A lot of those are pay to play too. So the scholarships pay to be listed there and they're trying to get exposure. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the best scholarships are the independent ones, which are even harder to find, but you know, they also have less competition. So like, you know, charity organizations in your community, maybe your parents' company, you know, maybe like associations or your religious groups or anything that you're a part of. Uh, maybe in the career fields you want to go into, they have ones. Like pretty much every career has a trade organization or a union or, or something. And those companies and organizations run scholarships, but they're not, most of those aren't listed on these search engines. But if you spend the time and you research them and look for them, also, because they're not, so many less people apply and your odds of winning are so much better. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So how do you help people? You have a blog, a radio show. Yeah. How do people come to you and what do you do with them? Yeah, so I mean, we are just a media company. I want to give you the best information I can to help you make informed financial decisions. Ideally, pay for college, get out of debt, start investing and building wealth as early as possible, right? Um, I do have a paid service called Loan Buddy that if you're already in student loan debt and you're trying to figure out the best way to get out, 
Um, it's free to start, and then there's upsells in there that can help you navigate your student loans. Um, but really, I just wanna help you for free. I can get paid by advertisers and other things. Like, really, I just want you to make a smart, informed financial decision so that hopefully we're talking about how you're on the path to financial independence and not the path of like digging yourself out of student loans. Yeah, so let's dig into that for a minute. How do you monetize your blog? Because that that's another reasonable side hustle for students who are, you know, trying to make some money. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I mean, this is the funny thing is talking to high school students. I can't tell you how many want to be an influencer when they grow mm -hmm. up. Like mm -hmm. it's one of these things that if you went back five years ago, it wasn't like on the radar. And now it's like, how many people want to be an influencer? And it's like, oh, like so many hands go up yeah. and you can be an influencer for anything, but you have to have some kind of content that like gives you credibility. And so I get paid by advertisers. I get paid by every pretty much financial company that exists in the United States is a partner with us in some way. Sometimes we do brand deals. Sometimes I get paid like if you open an account, um, all kind of different ways. Um, but it's because I've built a really big website. I've been doing it for 10 years. I answer pretty much every financial question. We do unbiased reviews and comparisons and you know, a lot of people visit us. So it all comes around at full circle and that's why we get these. If you're just starting out, it's totally possible, but you gotta figure out what you wanna be an influencer of, right? It could be fashion, it could be makeup, it could be uh, you know, money, it could be cars. I don't know, the list goes on and you will find advertisers and companies that want to sponsor you and pay for you to get out in front of your audience, but you have to figure out it's crafting an audience first. You gotta find someone that wants that and that means you have to, have something to be of value to them. You gotta be in service to them. And, and you don't have to be the expert. I always like to say you have to be expert enough, right? You just have to be like one step ahead of the people that you're trying to teach. And so like maybe you're gonna share your journey. Well, that's cool. Like share your journey, show that you're not an expert, but like everyone that's gonna be following you, you have to realize is watching you because of that. They're like one step behind you and they wanna mimic you and they wanna see your journey. So it's just understanding what your audience is and then there's usually products, services, tools, resources that you use and that you can likely connect your audience with. And if it's a win-win situation, you can probably get paid for it too because that company or resource tool would like to get those customers. How long did it take you from starting the blog to actually make you know, money that you were happy about? Because I also, I don't want anyone to think this is overnight success. For most people, any side hustle isn't going to be overnight success. You have to be in the game. hundred percent. So, I mean, I didn't even make my first dollar for like a year and a half. So like nothing. And then even in that first year that I made it, which is actually year two, I made about $7,000 on the site, which is solid. Like I take that as side hustle income any day. And then it continued to grow from there and there, but it takes time. I did it consistently. Even from the start when I wasn't making anything, I was still putting out a blog post three days a week, every single week just rolling through. And so I was learning and getting better because I think the other thing most people don't realize is that when you start something, you are not good at it. It's just frankly what it is. And this you is have my to, studio right here. <laughs> that's okay. But I'm right. just saying it takes, it takes practice. The more you do something, uh, the better you get at it. And in terms like it just propels your growth. So like your first episode, your first blog post, your first Instagram story, like whatever it is, it's probably terrible when you look back at it in hindsight. But if you start doing it every day or, you know, every week, like you get better. Yeah. And that you, gives you the opportunity to grow, right? If you sit around and you wait to be good at something, it's never going to happen because you're never going to get there. You've just, you've got to do it. I mean, I struggle right. with that with this show all the time. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even edit my shows unless there's a major flaw that needs to be edited. I just throw it up there. You know, and yeah. one, one teeny tiny step at a time. Yeah, and it just takes practice though, and that's it. And I even joke like, you know, even to be an all-star baseball player, an all-star baseball player bats like 350. That means they're only hitting one out of every three, you know, pitches that are, you know, every time they're at bat, they're only hit, making it on base one every three times. You know, and like imagine what it took for them to get there. I mean, they were probably playing since they were kids. And they were just over and over and over and over and over and over again. And that's what they get to. And that's how it is for pretty much every content creator and influencer out there. Not everything sticks, but you have to take those at bats. You have to keep practicing. And then you start learning and figuring it out as you go. And then you can increase your odds and your average over time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
so is there a way to have well let me back let me back up you said at one point that you heard lots of scary loan debt advice yeah what's oh, the scary advice well so the problem when you come out of student out of school and you're trying to figure out to pay back your student loans is that there are over 150 different options for your student loans that's the crazy part right <laughs> I, I've, I don't, I've done, I've I don't even it. know what you mean by that. So between the repayment plan options, loan forgiveness options, the type of loan you Got have it. to okay. start with, deferment and forbearance, like the list goes on and on. There's just like the choices that you have when you come out is over 150 different things that you can choose from and paths that you can take. And they're scary. It's debt. You get a bill in the mail and all of a sudden you're supposed to start repaying this and you might not even have your job lined up yet. And so as a result, there's all these companies that prey on people, right? Just like everything else, people that you get these robo calls for your taxes. I don't know if you've gotten the robo calls for your student loans, right? Like, you know, we can guarantee you student loan forgiveness. And it's like this horrible robo call, but people fall for I get stuff. them. I get yeah. them and I don't even have student loans. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so this stuff is out there and they are scamming people left and right. Like, first off, you should never have to pay for help with your student loans. Your loan servicer can help you. You can Google it. And I'm pretty sure you'll get all the answers you need when you Google it. You can go on to studentloans.gov, which is the Department of Education's website. Make sure you go to the gov part, not like .com or anything else, but studentloans.gov. And you can get all the answers. They're there. The problem is that people want to like think that there's more out there beyond this. And with federal loans, all of the programs are set by law. There's no magic bullet. Like these are Congress set the programs. They're set in stone. Like the answers are very black and white. There's no gray area. There's no like negotiating. Like you owe the debt to the U.S. taxpayer, if you think about it that way. And so these companies that even service your loans, like the Navients, the Nelnets, the Fed loans of the world, they can't do anything because you owe the debt to the U.S. taxpayer. So the law is set by Congress and they're just acting on Congress's behalf. So when you hear a company say, I can guarantee you loan forgiveness or you can, I can get your payment to zero or all this stuff, like they're just selling you lip service. Maybe they can, but you also don't have to pay for it. You can go and do it yourself for free. And that's what I try to do with Loan Buddy. And that's why we start for free. And there are people do want to pay for service and they want to pay for more help, but I'll give you the best answer for free because you can get that for free anywhere else in the world. You could take that answer, go on studentloans.gov, complete all your stuff yourself. It's not hard. If you can fill out a job application, if you've made it, if you've made it to the point in life where you're taking on a student loan, I promise you that you know enough about answering paperwork to figure out how to fill out the loan, like, you know, repayment plan questions and stuff like that. You know your name, you know your social, you can enter your income, like you can, you can do it. I'm so, so glad don't let you these said companies that. say that <laughs> to scare I, you, yeah. You know, because I, I think it does seem scary to someone walking out of school on their own, more or less for the first time, all of a sudden they do have this money that they owe back and they're like, oh, what am I going to do? Yeah. You know, and it, it is overwhelming to even think about just getting started. So I'm really glad you just encouraged us that it's it not is. as hard as. And it's hard because also I'll tell you for all the recent graduates, the first statement you get, that monthly payment is the highest monthly payment. So you automatically default into the 10 year standard repayment plan. And so that monthly payment is the biggest one that you could possibly be forced to pay. And so if, you, if that scares you, okay, there's options out there. Don't just like ignore it or like not pay it and think it's going to go away because it only gets worse from there. It doesn't get any better. Um, and there's options out there. You can get on income-based repayment and things like that that would lower your payment. It could be even legitimately, you can get a $0 a month payment assuming you don't make a lot of money. And that's legal and it works. But you got to just spend a little time, learn your options, get organized, a lot of borrowers have multiple loans. You figure you get one, you know, your freshman year, sophomore year, junior, senior year, you might have four or five loans by the time you graduate. You know, do your loan companies have your current address so you don't miss any paperwork? Like little things like that, making sure you're organized so that you can make a good decision um, to navigate your loans. All right, so let's fast forward again. Um, yeah. I know you talk a lot about investing and multiple streams of income. So when... 
when do young people start looking at that? Because it's so easy to say, oh, I'm, you know, when I'm out of debt, when I get rich, then I'll start doing these things. Yeah. It's just, it's easy to say that, but the best time to start is now. It's as early as you possibly can. Start and save, start saving and investing in high school. Like there's, you can't go wrong with starting as early as you can. And the cool thing is, is you can start with $5 these days. Like there's so many ways to just get started. But the thing about investing, what most people don't talk about is that the number one driver of your wealth until you're about 50 is simply how much you put into your savings accounts. Doesn't matter what you're invested in. Doesn't matter if you can get like a 10% return or a 5% return or whatever. It's simply how much you can put away. Because the thing is, is until you're about 50, there's not enough money in the pot to even make a difference on your return. <laughs> like if you only have a hundred, let's just say you have a thousand dollars to keep the math easy and you get a hundred percent return on your thousand dollars. Well, now you have $2,000, which one, that's pretty cool, right? Like, oh my God, I doubled my money, but you're not living off of that. You're not retiring on that 2000 bucks. Like it doesn't change the game for you at all. And so the number one thing that changes the game is simply how much you can put into your accounts as early as possible. Because investing is not only about return, but it's about the time in the market. And the more time you give your money to grow, the more it'll grow. And it's not till you get to about 40 or 50 or 60 even, that you really start seeing huge growth in your investment and retirement accounts. But that's also hard from a psychology perspective because it doesn't feel good. <laughs> like we're in this like instant gratification age. And so if you save $100 or $1,000 and it grows by 10%, that $1,000 is now worth $1,100. And you're just like, that's it? I did all that work for a thousand, a hundred dollars, like, ugh. But the thing is, is next year, you're gonna add another thousand and it's gonna grow even more. And now you're at like 2,500 and then you do it again and now you're at 4,000 and then you do it again. And then, you know, that, that could easily grow into a million dollars. If you start at a thousand dollars when you're 20, 22, you could have a million dollars. But if you don't start until you're 40, that thousand dollars is only gonna grow into like a hundred thousand dollars because you just didn't give it enough time. So even starting with a teeny tiny bit of money, you know, when you're 18 or whatever it is, just do it. Just start, get in the habit. Just start. And let it cook. Let it grow. Let it cook. Don't touch it. You know, the number one type of individual that, you know, who does best in the market, I guess is the best way to put it. Dead people. <laughs> because they don't touch their money. They just let it go. Their accounts, they died and their accounts just kept growing. It was a study done a couple of years ago and Fidelity looked at every account that they have and they have over a trillion dollars in money that they manage. And the accounts that performed the best over the last 20 years were accounts that belong to dead people because they didn't fiddle with it. They just let it grow. It was just there, yeah. <laughs> it just grew and that's what you gotta think about it. At 18, 20, 22, Put in any bit you can. Put in birthday money. Put in recycling can money. I don't know. Just get the money in there and let it grow. And I guarantee you by the time you're 35 or 40, you're, you're going to be like leaps and bounds ahead of everybody you know in the workplace, all of your friends. And, uh, you know, they might judge you when you're 18, like, why are you doing this? But they're going to judge you again at 35. And they're going to be like, dang, how did he do that? Repeat again what you said, because you said it so well, the, the number one, what was it? The number one predictor of your wealth or whatever it was. The, yeah. The number one predictor of your wealth is simply how much you can stash away, right? It's how much you save because you just can't, you know, grow a lot if you don't have a lot to grow. You got to just put it in there. And there's a lot of studies and stats out there, but you know, if you could save 50% of your income, I guarantee you in 10 to 15 years, you could probably retire. Most people can't get there and that's the hard part. But if you can, you could probably do it in 10 years. If you only save 25% of your income, it's probably going to take you 20 to 30 years, which now we're talking normal retirement type ages. You know, and if you save even less than that, you're going to be the guy working until you're 75 because you just didn't save it when you started, when you had the chance to. You're gonna, you buy the big car. And this is the big thing I say, when you're 22, live like a college student for the next 10 years. Just keep living that way. You don't need, you don't deserve, you don't you owe yourself a car. You don't need to buy yourself a house. Like stick to your studio apartment with a roommate. Like you'll be so much more thankful for it. Yeah. 
how, um, how do you recommend someone get started? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing though is simply getting organized. I think we dismiss, this is like step zero effectively. Like unless you're organized with your money, it's hard to even figure out where to start. Do you save a little more? Do you cut your budget? Do you try to side hustle? Well, I don't know. What is your, what's, what's coming in? What's going out? What's in your accounts? Like, let's start there. And so I really urge everyone, especially in high school, I started in high school, like whether it is a planner, whether it is a tool, like a spreadsheet or like a mint.com, personal capital, quick game, like an actual like app, uh, you need to find some kind of thing that works for you and your style to get organized with your money. Um, just knowing what your account balance is, knowing what's coming in, what's going out, because then as you start getting more income and you're trying to pay off your loans or whatnot, you can start making better choices. Like, oh my God, I spent like $500 eating out last month. Like maybe I should cut there or maybe like the math doesn't work. And you're like, if I only just earn an extra hundred dollars this month, everything balances. And so then you decide I'm going to earn a hundred dollars. I'm going to go drive for Uber and I'm going to make that. Like it gives you a much clearer picture of what you should do. And everyone's got a different picture. So I can't tell you, but I can say get organized and so that you know exactly where you stand. Yeah. So be aware of what's coming in and what's going out. What's coming in, what's going out, what the balances are in your accounts and your checking account, savings account, maybe your 401k when you're getting started, like know what you got what your loan balance is. I can't tell you. Every single person that comes to me, it's, this is without fail, 100% of people that come to me with student loan debt problems don't even know what their student loan debt, they owe, how many loans they have, what their balances are. Without fail. Getting organized lets us like actually figure out where to go from here. And until you're organized, you just, you can't make a good choice. You don't even know if you're making the right choice because you don't know. And I, you know, I think it's so easy to just not, not want to know because it's a scary thing that you don't want to have to deal with. So you don't look, you just make your payments. You don't want to think about it. Um, kind of. And you know, it's hard because when you start with money, you know, I don't know, but a lot of kids, they start with like a, a, a jar or an envelope. And then we kind of like grow up to like a checking account or like a bank, one bank account. The hard part is, is like all of a sudden when you turn 18, it like blows up. And now you got like all these accounts. You got a checking account and a student loan account and you might have like a school account and maybe a savings account. And then you get a job and you get a 401k and it's like all this stuff just comes at you so fast. And it's like by the time you're 24, you got a bunch of stuff and you got to figure it out. And that's where it's like if you don't get organized earlier, it just becomes harder to get organized later. But you got to do it. It doesn't matter when. You just got to do it. Yeah. And if you do it early, then as those pieces are added in, you have a lot more control and knowledge over what's happening. Exactly. And you can just add it in, you have a system, then you can just see how it all connects and you can start making decisions around that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So we're getting out of college and I know you're a fan of multiple streams of income. Yep. What is that? for those of us who don't know, and, and what does that look like for a young person? Sure, so I mean, there's a YouTube video and all these memes going around, but it's like, you know, the average millionaire has seven streams of income, right? And it's true, they do. So what's an income stream? Well, most of us have a work. We have a, you know, just a job, we get a paycheck, and that's a stream of income. The goal of it is, is there's really like four buckets of how you can make money and use your money. You have yourself, you. You work, you get paid, boom, that's pretty straightforward. You also have the potential to have paper assets. So these are like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, a 401k, a savings account. And that's the first step that a lot of people do is they take the little bit of their earnings that they can and they put it into their 401k. And so now you have this paper asset that someday down the line, you can hopefully turn that into an income stream. And you know, ideally we all get to retirement, we stop working, so our paycheck goes to zero. And then we get an income stream from our 401k and that's how we live and pay our bills. And then you can also invest in real estate, right? So you can have a rental property. So, in, you know, in lieu of or in addition to like your 401k, you could save for a down payment. You could buy a rental property. And your rental property, those people pay rent. And hopefully it covers all the mortgage and expenses. And then that income comes into you. And, you know, maybe you pay off the mortgage. Now all that rent is your income. And then you also have a small business or a side hustle. 
That's like the, the fourth big bucket. So you can have an income stream on the side of your W-2. Maybe it is ride sharing or delivering food or selling on eBay or Etsy. And that's an income stream. But the goal is, is you got to diversify across these platforms. Yet one day you're not going to be able to work. It's just, it's going to happen. I hopefully for everybody listening, it happens way down the road. when We're all in our sixties and seventies and you just have to stop working. Uh, but you know, it could happen sooner. And that's where it's like, you do want to have other streams of income, your 401k, retirement accounts, investments, you know, real estate's not for everybody, but it's an option. A side hustle is not for everybody, but it's an option. But by taking these extra income streams, you invest in ones you don't have as many of, and then you start getting extra income that can offset your working. And ideally, we all stop working, maybe some sooner, maybe some later, but all the other income streams make up for it or more than make up for it. And it's, it's a great backup plan if you lose your job and you're out of work for a little while, you know, you, you just have other things to rely on or other things that you can throw your, your time and money into too. Exactly. And that's where people say like the emergency funds, kind of like the first income stream, right? You save up to six months of expenses because, you know, for most people working, a job loss is probably your first emergency. But now you turn that savings account where you save six months of expenses into an income stream and you're drawing down on it to cover your bills till you get your W-2 your paycheck back and start earning again there. And so that's why it's just about saving and diversifying because, you know, we talk, here's a funny thing. We talk a lot about getting loans for paying for college, but nobody is going to give you a loan to retire. You just can't get a loan to retire. The only way you're going to retire is to save for yourself, right? <laughs> and, and so many of us say, oh, well, I'm going to do this when I retire. I'm going to travel. I'm going to, you know, go to the beach all the time or whatever. But if you're not putting things in place for that now, then, you know, that's not going to happen. Well, not even that. If you don't do that stuff today, you're not going to do it when you retire. you got to find that balance. Yeah. Like I'm telling you right now from lots of experience with people that have retired or even early retirees, these people that like bailed the workplace at 40. If you don't do these things, you know, from 20 to 40, what makes you think you flip a switch and you start doing them? You've got to build in passions and recreation and figure out what you like throughout your whole life. And then maybe you get more time to do it. And maybe working is your thing. Because like, you know, we always say like, oh, I got to retire. You know what? But people that love their jobs and love what they do, they also don't retire. You know, they keep going because they love it. It's who they are. It's their identity. And maybe that's you too. Like, it doesn't have to be like, I work so hard to get out of the workplace. Like, it's okay to do work you love. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and um, also just, I want to be doing things that I want to do now. Can right. I do them a hundred percent of the time? No, I do still have to work, but I'm, my husband and I are very much into the idea of lifestyle design where yeah. for those of people listening who don't know, like you're designing your job and your life around all of the things you want to do. So I'm mm -hmm. intentionally, I don't never want a fancy studio for my show. If it, if it takes off, I still want to be able to do it anywhere from my bedroom, from my RV, from my hotel room. I don't want a fancy studio because I don't want to be tied to a location. I want to be able to work wherever I go. Exactly. And I think it's hard though, when you talk to young adults, like it does take a little bit to get your feet wet. You, it takes like a year or two to just navigate your postgraduate life. It's a big life transition. But like, I think, you know, this old school mindset where it's like, you know, you get two weeks a year and stuff like, yeah, that's still a thing. But it's like, how are you using your time? Are you taking like two weeks and going somewhere fun? Or are you taking like three day weekends twice a month for the whole year and, and traveling every twice a month, right? Like, there's like a lot of things that you can do to, to build your lifestyle, even in a career focused life. But I think a lot of people just get caught up in a whole variety of issues, right? And so like, you gotta decide for yourself, like no one's gonna help you navigate this life more than you. You gotta like understand yourself and it's super easy for us to talk about this on the podcast. Like the actual <laughs> like, you know, ability to navigate this is very challenging and there's a lot to it and everyone's got their own unique identity. But I think the big thing is the math is the math. It doesn't matter what you wanna do. Like there's, there's a magic number out there that allow you to retire. There's a magic number that you need to live off of every single month just to pay your bills. You know, like you can earn X dollars at your work. You could earn X more dollars side hustle. Like, I mean, you can just do the math. And so however that math fits into your bigger life though is what you have to figure out. And that's a little more challenging from the psychology part, but just realize that the numbers are the numbers and the math is the math. 
Yeah, Tim Tim Ferriss has the exercise where you kind of, you know, write out your your goal, what you want, your dream life or whatever, and then has you kind of reverse engineer it to do the math. What's the yep. worst case scenario? What are the bad things that can happen so that, you know, if your ideal goes wrong, what what gets screwed up? You know, uh, what do you need to be prepared for? And then how much money do you need to actually make your thing happen? Right. Once you know that, then you can take action. Uh, if totally. you don't have those concrete pieces in there, then you're kind of stuck living in dreamland without that action. Totally. And I think the other thing that a lot of young people need to realize is that it doesn't take a lot of money to start things. What it takes is time, though. Everything, you can use time or money, and they're actually pretty interchangeable. So if you don't have a lot of time, you can spend a lot more money to pay people or do things. But if you don't have any money, you can also just spend a lot of time and do it all yourself. But the cool thing when you're young is also when you have the most time. You know, like when you're 22 and you don't have kids yet and you're single and like, you know, that's when you have the most free time that you could do these projects. Because honestly, once you get a significant other and once you have kids, like you have competing priorities for your time. And so you have to manage that. So like the earlier you start, the more time you have to invest and you can't get time back. It's like the one finite resource that we all are dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't wait to tomorrow to put that money away or, or look into starting that side hustle or whatever. You just you got to do it. Right. I mean, that's, I always love that. There's like a Chinese proverb, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Yeah. Like we all kick ourselves. We want to go back. We wish we could plant it. But if you start today, you look back, you know, 20 years in the future and you have a giant tree and it's grown and you nourished it. Like just start. I think that is a perfect place to leave our audience with start today, right now, if you're listening exactly. and this inspired you to get organized about your money or to look into a side hustle or whatever it is, start right now, like right exactly. now. Exactly. <laughs> Take some action. That's, that's the best thing you can do. Even if you don't know all the answers, just start. And you'll never know all the answers. Never will. And the more, the more you start looking, the more questions you'll have and the less answers you'll have. And that's a good <laughs> thing. We should always be in that state. Yep. Um, so where can people find you, your website? I'll put it all in the, in the notes, but tell us too. Yeah, definitely. So you can go to the college Um, you can listen to us on your favorite podcasting platform, the college investor audio show, or you can find us on YouTube at the college investor. And I meant to ask you this earlier. I'm super curious. Is this your full-time gig or is this a side yep. hustle for you? Okay. Nope. It's been my full-time gig now for about two and a half years. So, uh, yeah, but I side hustled it for the first eight years. So Yeah. So it's now gone past the side hustle and is your, your full income stream. Yep. Um, how much time are you putting into it on a, so a weekly I put basis? about 20 to 30 hours a week. Okay. All right. So it's definitely <laughs> still very actively you. Yep. It's actively me. But the cool thing is, is I was able to eliminate my day job because I was probably putting in 20 to 30 hours a week when it was a side hustle. Yeah. So now I just don't have my 40 to 50 hour a week job. And so I have some lifestyle freedom, which is important to me. I spend time with, I have two young kids, take them to school, I'm married, do things like that's what's important to me when we're talking about building a life that you care about and that's important to you. And that's, that's what's important to me at this season of life. And I do believe too, that everyone has a season of life. Like it's going to change. It might change a few years from now. It was definitely different for me a few years ago. And it's the same for your listeners out there. Like your college life is a season, then you graduate, you have like a few transition years after college, then you have like your early career, and then you have, you know, significant other and kids, like you have all these seasons. And so realize if you're not happy today, start planning what you want to do in your next season of life, because things do change, even though it feels like it doesn't. Like, even if you look back a couple of years ago from wherever you are listening to this, I guarantee your life was a different place. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being here. I hope this inspired people to take some action. Get thank organized you. This has about been their fun. money. Yes, yeah. I hope so. Um, and I will definitely direct people your way. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been so fun. Thank you.